So if you have your Bibles with you, if you'll turn with me over to James chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 14 through 26 today with a message I've entitled, It's Time to Grow Up. In the 1960s, there was a television show that many of you may remember called The Beverly Hillbillies. It was a very popular show. Uh, And the premise of the show was this. Uh, Let's take a family of hillbillies out of their element. Let's put them in Beverly Hills and look at the comedy that unfolds when you have people who were not living according to the custom and tradition that they were used to living in. And it made for great comedy. As a matter of fact, one episode entitled Giant Jackrabbit where Granny sees a kangaroo for the first time and thinks it's a jackrabbit, 65% of the United States, that is 65% of Americans, tuned in to watch that episode. Now, while shows like this make for great comedy, James will tell us this morning that not living according to our new position in Christ is a tragedy for the Christian life. And this particular passage that we're looking at this morning can be very difficult to interpret. As a matter of fact, the great reformer Martin Luther called James an epistle of straw because it seemed to contradict Paul's understanding that justification is by faith alone. James will introduce this section when he will ask in a moment, What use is it, my brethren, if a person says that he has faith but he has no works? Can that faith save or deliver him? A couple of ways to interpret that. One, and this is probably the majority report among many Christian evangelicals today, uh, and Dr. MacArthur would hold this position. He says this, no less than five times in that passage, verse 14, 17, 20, 24, and 26, James reiterates his thesis. Passive faith is not efficacious faith. It is a frontal attack on the empty profession of those whose hope is in a dominant faith. Faith in this context is clearly saving faith. James is speaking of eternal salvation. That's one view of this particular passage. There is another view of this particular pericope, and it is being advanced uh, by, uh, represented by Dr. Zane Hodges of Dallas Seminary, uh, who notes this. When faith is described as dead in James 2, specifically here verse 14, this can easily be understood in context as meaning that faith is sterile ineffectual or unproductive. So how do we reconcile this? What we need to understand is that when we're talking about faith and justification, that Paul and James are talking about two different things. Paul is speaking of a salvation from the penalty of sin and being justified before God. James, on the other hand, is speaking on salvation from the power of sin in the life of the believer and justification before men. So they aren't talking about the same thing. For example, uh, in Paul's view, particularly what we get from Romans and Galatians, Paul is talking about that being justified is by faith alone. Salvation is by faith and not works, and that works do not justify a man. James's view, on the other hand, is that faith must have works in order to deliver or save. So the context for James would not be soteriological, meaning it is not saved from the penalty of sin, but rather saved or delivered from the power of sin. And that's why he notes that faith without works is dead. And then he will too use two examples, uh, Abraham, a patriarch and a prostitute, to demonstrate his Thesis. 
And so as we get ready to go into the passage this morning, we need to understand James is going to demonstrate for us three things. First, he wants us to know our faith. Secondly, he wants us to show our faith. And third, he wants us to grow in faith. So let's begin by looking at verses 14 through 19. Again, James says that faith without works cannot save or deliver. Notice what he says. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but he has no works, can that faith save him? Now, the word saved, and we've talked about this on several occasions in the past, that save, or the word sozo, uh, the verb sozo, the noun soteria, uh, always is provided within a context of an author's statement, meaning the context of how the word is used will determine from what one is being saved or delivered from. So every time, and I know in Southern Baptists we have a bad habit of saying, are you saved? And constantly equating the word saved in the scriptures with saved from the penalty of sin. And we've gone through this on numerous occasions to demonstrate that that's not necessarily the case. In this case, being saved is not from the penalty of sin. Rather, it is being delivered from the power of sin in a believer's life. Again, the context of what one is delivered from is the consequences of temporal judgment and the potential loss of rewards at the Bema, which he had just previously discussed in verses 12 and 13 of James 2. You'll recall last week we talked about that. Again, we have to look at the verse within the context of the overall passage. So we saw last week James's admonition. So speak and so act as those who were to be judged by the law of liberty, for judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And so he's exhorting the congregation, don't show partiality in the church because ultimately we will all give an account before the Lord at the Bema. And so his being delivered is something that's still future. Uh, Dr. Tony Evans notes this. He says, Faith is not demonstrated in your words. It is revealed in what you do in response to God's direction. In order for faith to work, it must be practiced. That is, it must be lived out. And that brings us to verse 15 and James's continuing argument. Faith must be joined to works in order to be a vital kind of faith. He says in verse 15, by giving an example, If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for the body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. And so what he's saying is, is, uh, I used this illustration, I think, probably within the last month, uh, but imagine a brother or sister, a fellow Christian, coming to your door at night, knocking on the door. They're cold and they're hungry, and you simply just hold a Bible study with them and exchange information, giving them the right theology, but not necessarily meeting their physical needs, and then you say, be warm and be filled and go on your way, you haven't met any need at all. Your faith hasn't done anything. You've just merely given them information. So faith must be married to works. In other words, the obligation that the Christian has is to feed and clothe the hungry brother or sister who comes with a need. That's why James says faith by itself that is expressed in word only, is useless. Now, James uses a common literary device to prove his argument. Now, notice what he says in verse 18. But someone may well say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. Now, what in the world is this? It's referred to as a diatribe, a diatribe. And what a diatribe is, is a literary device used to answer a perceived objection that the writer knows the reader will have. 
For example, Paul the Apostle uses this device over in Romans chapter 9, where Paul is talking about God's selection of Israel over all of the other nations of the earth, and specifically those who would ultimately become part of the covenant community, both in the Old and New Testaments. And the objection to that is, well, if God is selecting who those individuals are, then that's not fair. And so Paul understands the objection that some may have in reference to what he's articulating. And so then he asks this question, what then shall we say? Is there no injustice with God, is there? And then in the Greek, he uses the most emphatic kind of way you can say no. It would be like, no, not ever, or no, may it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For Scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then, he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. And then here's the objector. In other words, Paul is writing in this objector to help articulate what he's trying to explain to the church. He says, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? Well, who, who's Paul talking about here? Again, he's talking about the church in Rome, and he understands that what he's just said is something difficult. Because if it is God who does what he does, and it doesn't depend on the person who wills or the person who runs, but upon God who shows mercy, again, the objection is, that's not fair. And that's why he writes in, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, Why did you make me like this, will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? Again, so Paul writes in this objector to help explain his argument because he perceives that many uh, whom he's addressing will have this same kind of question. James does the exact same thing in his diatribe. James is going to write in an objector into the passage in that uh, it poses or he will pose a question in regards to faith and works. The objector's point is that there is no necessary correlation between a, what a person believes and what a person does as a result of that belief. Uh, as a matter of fact, many who have examined and written commentaries on this uh, by way of translators and those who write commentaries uh, are not quite sure where the objector is writing. In other words, James writes, James writes in this objector, look at verse 18, but someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Now in the NIV, that's in quotations. So what that translator or that body of translators would say is, well, the objector saying, you have faith and I have deeds. And then James's response starts with, show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by what I do. So that's the way the NIV translates it. Over in the New American Standard, verse 18 is translated like this. But someone may well say, so here's the objector, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. So you see that that includes a little bit more than the way the NIV translates it. Uh, another translation, the Weymouth translation, uh, is written like this. Nay, someone will say, you have faith and I have actions. Prove to me your faith from corresponding actions, and I will prove mine to you by my actions. You believe that God is one, and you are right. Evil spirits also believe this and shudder. And so they have all of that included in what the objector is saying. Uh, even in the Greek text, it's verses 18 and 19. You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith from your works and I will show you from my works my faith. You believe that there is one God, you do well. The demons also believe and tremble. 
Uh, Dr. Hodges, in his commentary on this, says this. Uh, the argument that James is using is a reductio ad absurdum, or a reduction to absurdity. It says to the objector to see a close connection between faith and works. And for the sake of the argument, let's say you have faith and I have works. Let's start there. You can no more start with what you believe and show it to me in your works than I can start with my works and demonstrate what it is that I believe. And so the objector is confident both tasks are impossible. So let me put this by way of a modern day illustration. For example, Mormons, that is, uh, those who adhere or subscribe to the Latter day Saints doctrine, Mormons believe that God is one. In other words, they believe in the unity of God. Christians believe that God is one. Some Mormons believe that husbands can have many wives. Christians believe husbands should have only one wife, for no man can serve two masters, for he will hate the one. No. <laughs> Just making sure you're awake. <laughs> And so both believe in the unity of God in terms of what they believe, but in terms of how they behave, that is their ethic, it's different. Again, both groups believe or would hold or subscribe to the doctrine of the unity of God, but their actions or works are different. And so the point is that there is no connection between faith and works. And that's what the objector is trying to raise. And that's why James says, you should show your faith. Because here's his response to the objector. He says, but are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow? So James writes in the objector, and now he's calling him foolish. He says, are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? He's going to use an illustration. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of his works, faith was perfected or matured or fully developed. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Again, when justified here, uh, we're talking about justified, one view, by faith in God. And it's something that uh, Paul is making a reference to over in Romans and in Galatians. Uh, for example, in Romans 4, Paul notes this. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. And so you'll recall that we've said in the past, in reference to the Abrahamic covenant, God comes to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, and he tells him, leave your land, I'm going to take you to a land, I'm going to give you many descendants, and I'm going to give you great blessing. And by faith, Abraham leaves the Ur of the Chaldees, and he departs uh, and goes to follow God. Now, in Genesis 15, God's promises to Abraham are ratified by means or by way of a blood covenant. And in Genesis 15, Moses writes this, And God took him outside and said, Now look towards the heaven and count the stars, if you were able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Now watch this, Then Abraham believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. So salvation comes to Abraham by believing or trusting in the promises of God. That happens in Genesis chapter 15. But there's also another kind of justification, which is a justification before men. And this we see in Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac. Uh, this is recorded for us and discussed in a couple of different places. The first is in Genesis chapter 22. You'll recall that God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, take your only son Isaac, 
the child of promise, and I want you to sacrifice him as a burnt offering. And so Abraham gathers Isaac, who at this time is probably around 23 to 25 years old. Again, this is Genesis chapter 22. This is some 20 to 25 uh, years after Genesis chapter 15. Remember, Abraham is saved in Genesis chapter 15. That is, he's justified or declared righteous by God in Genesis 15. Genesis 22, several years later. And so Abraham takes his servants and he takes Isaac and they walk to the mountain to go worship God. Now, notice what Abraham says. Abraham said to his young men, his servants who were with him, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad, that is Isaac, We'll go over there and we will worship and return to you. And so the question then is, if God had told Abraham that he's going to sacrifice his son Isaac, and by a sacrifice we're talking about ending Isaac's life, then how is it that Abraham can say, we're going to go over there and worship God together and when we're done we're going to come back? How can he say that? So the two of them walked on. So Abraham takes up Isaac, lays him on the altar. He's getting ready to sacrifice. He lifts the knife. Notice what happens here in uh, Hebrews chapter 11. He, he stops, he's, an angel of the Lord stops Abraham. He says, now I know that you believe. And there was a ram in a thicket that had been there the whole time that didn't make any sound until Abraham obeyed God all the way at which time the ram made a noise and they were able to sacrifice that ram. But what was going through Abraham's mind during this whole process? Hebrews eleven seventeen 17 tells us this, It was by faith that Abraham offered up Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who would receive God's promise, was ready to sacrifice his only son Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, watch this, God was able to bring him back to life again. That's why he could say, we're going to go worship God together, and when we're done, we will come back. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. Thus, when we look at verse 24, it says that a, uh, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Uh, the thing that we need to keep in mind as we look at verse 24 is that little word alone. That is an adverb. Uh, in the Greek text, it's the word monon. And it is a modifier, but it's not the modifier of faith. Faith is a noun. Adverbs modify what? Verbs. So the verb, the nearest antecedent of the verb is justified. So we could actually translate it this way. You see then that a man is justified by works and not only justified by faith. Two kinds of justification. There's a justification before God and a justification before men. So what does this mean? Hodges notes, James is saying that a by faith justification is not the only kind of justification there is. There is also a by works justification. The former type is before God. The latter type is before men. God understands. He can see our hearts. He, can see, he understands our motives. He sees our motives. But men can't see that. We can say that we're believers, but when they see the works that follow after what we claim, then they will understand it. God doesn't have to do that because He's omniscient. He knows. So what we see then is that in Genesis chapter 15, Abraham believes and uh, Genesis chapter 22, Abraham uh, sacrifices. And uh, Abraham believes faith before God, in, described by Romans 4 and Galatians 3. And then in uh, James 2 and Romans 4 as well, there's works before men. Faith is born when Abraham believes in Genesis 15. Faith is perfected in Genesis 22 when Abraham goes all the way, that is, he's willing to go all the way, in offering Isaac. Uh, Genesis chapter 15, Abraham is justified before God. In Genesis chapter 22, Abraham is justified before men. In Genesis chapter 15, 
There is a judicial declaration of Abraham's righteousness before God. And then in Genesis 22, there is a demonstration of experiential righteousness before men. In Genesis chapter 15, Abraham is declared to be a believer in God, that is a follower of God. In Genesis chapter 22, after his obedience, he is called God's friend. So that's one example. You say, what use is it, my brethren, if a man says that he has faith, but he has no works, can that faith save or deliver him? That's why I said it's very difficult to demonstrate how this is soteriological. That is, he's dealing with salvation from the penalty of sin because both examples that he uses, both Abraham and Rahab, were already saved when he's talking about what it is that they did. We see the same thing with Rahab. Rahab was justified by works as a result of her proven faith. She is listed in the great hall of faith and is in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. So look at verse 25. In the same way then was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? Again, some will say, well, what kind of justification here? What are we looking at? Well, if we go back and look at the history, and even though we get little snapshots of it uh, as the Israelites are coming into the promised land, she was justified, that is, saved or delivered from sin's penalty by faith in God. This is demonstrated over in Joshua chapter 2. And Rahab said to the men, these were the spies who went into uh, Jericho, I know that the Lord has given you the land, now notice she even uses the covenant name of God, Yahweh. When you see capital L, capital O, cap capital R, capital D, uh, that is uh, an English word, but the reference is to the, to the word Yahweh, the great I Am. She says, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you, for we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. Watch this. For Yahweh your God... He is God in heaven, above and on earth beneath. That is a declaration of salvific faith. Now we see she's justified before men by what she does. What did she do? Well, she sent the spies out another way. By faith, Hebrews 11 tells us, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace and then ultimately send them out another way, sparing their lives. As a result, she becomes part of the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ and of King David. So what we see then is that in the example of Abraham and in the example of Rahab, you have faith being married to works to produce the offspring of spiritual development and confidence in God. That is, shown or demonstrated faith. So James tells us we are to know our faith, to show our faith, and then finally we are to grow in faith. Look at verse 26. James notes this, that as the body without the soul is useless, so faith, if it is not accompanied by works, is useless. Look at uh, again what he says. For just as the body without the spirit is dead... So faith without works is dead. What he's saying is this, is that if, if you want what makes a dead person's body to make the body animated again, then you have to take what was in the body, that's left the body, and put it back in the body, namely the spirit. Because without the spirit, the body will not move. I don't care how many times you talk over it. I don't care how many times you hang out with it or whatever. Uh, that body is dead until that which animates the body, namely the spirit, gets put back in. And so spiritual growth then is predicated on a working faith 
in and through the trials that God gives us to test us. That's how our faith grows and becomes a dynamic faith. And by passing the test of life, our faith grows and allows us to experience the blessings of heaven in our present temporal experience. In other words, God never meant for us to wait to heaven to wait till we get to heaven to experience the blessings of heaven, which we can experience in the here and now. The question is, where is your faith taking you? Where is your faith taking you? Here? You want to stay with Granny? Jed? Or do you want to stay here? As we close... I want us to ponder this, reflect upon this. Your faith must be energized by works in order to be a growing Christian. You can't say that you're a growing Christian if you don't ever do anything other than just say, well, I'm a Christian, but eh, I don't really read the Bible. I, I don't really do everything that I can, but at least I'm going to heaven. Do you understand what kind of a pathetic Christian life that that person will experience? There'll be no sense of inner peace, no sense of joy. Terrible. There are many, many opportunities in the church for us to engage in ministry that will help you grow and will help benefit other believers. Uh, The thing that we need to ask ourselves is, do we actively seek opportunities to engage in these ministries? Because if you want to have a growing faith, and not a dead faith. And by dead, I'm not talking about not existing. I'm talking about not being vital. Not moving you to the next spiritual level. Then you have to have faith married to works to produce the offspring of spiritual growth. And I pray that's our goal.